the Assyrian. You know, oftentimes we look to our Father's word for enlightenment as to what, what's the future going to be. And, and certainly, unfulfilled prophecy tells us exactly how things are going to come down. It's written, it will come to pass. But today I want you to think about this. God's given us a lot of history in his word, has he not? And you know, sometimes by understanding and looking and studying that history, it also tells us what the future holds. Because I'll assure you, just as things have been in the past, in many cases, is exactly how they're going to be in the future. And by understanding the types, the historical types in our Father's Word, it, it prepares us for the future. We can understand. You all know the Antichrist is coming first. And that's not what my, my message is today about. My message is I want you to think to yourself, am I prepared have I done everything that I can to be prepared for that one who will return? That's important, beloved. And, and I'll show you why here in a moment. The Assyrian, or the king of Assyria, is a vivid type for Antichrist. No question about it. Just as the king of Assyria laid siege on Israel and Judah over and over and over in history, so will he lay siege on Jerusalem once again in the future. Well, should that scare us? Should we be afraid of the Assyrian? Of course not. God told us in Isaiah chapter 10, verse 24, fear not the Assyrian. Christ told us in Luke chapter 10, verses 17 through 18, I give you power over all of your enemies. But does that mean we should just ignore this historical Assyrian? No, not when we can study him and learn more and more information that will help us understand what it's gonna be like when the Antichrist is here. Let's begin our study today with a warning from Paul. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Most of you probably knew where I was gonna start when I said a warning from Paul. But also in this 10th chapter of 1 Corinthians, we find a fantastic promise from our Heavenly Father to you. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant. Paul says, I don't want you not to know this. I don't want you to forget this if you already knew it how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. As Moses led the chief people of Israel out of Egypt, they were under that cloud. And what was the cloud? It was our heavenly father, a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Did they go over the sea? Did they go around the sea? No, ladies and gentlemen, they went through the sea. And we're all, notice the emphatic use of the repetition of the word all, baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And indeed, that was a type of baptism that, that those people went through. And did all eat the same spiritual meat, the manna from heaven that our heavenly Father gave the people. And eventually the quail when they complained about the manna. Of course, our, today our spiritual meat is what? The bread of life, of course. Verse 3. And did all eat the same spiritual meat? We got that. And did all drink the same spiritual drink? Imagine 2.1 million people approximately coming out of Egypt, Israel, with all of their uh, flocks and herds. And they're in the desert. How much water would it take to, to quench the thirst of all those? And that water came forth from that rock. For they drank of the spiritual rock that followed them, or went with them, better translated, and that rock was Christ, and the gateway to heaven, the gateway to our salvation, the living water that we partake of today so freely. But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. And you know what overthrew them in the wilderness? It was their own unbelief. 
over and over and over, God told them, we're going into the promised land, a land that flows with milk and honey. What did they do? They said, oh, let's send one man from each tribe into the promised land just to make sure that it's a, a good land. And God said, okay, go ahead and send them. What did they do? They came back and 10 of them lied and said, there's no way that we can take those people. They're giants over there, their own unbelief. Now, these things were for our examples. Check it out in the Greek, tupos. It means type, to the intent. Whoa, to the intent. Why were we given these examples, these types? To the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Paul's trying to get our attention here. He's saying, these things that happened in the Old Testament happen for a reason, people. Study them, understand them, so that you don't lust after evil. Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Even as Moses was up on Mount Sinai receiving the Ten Commandments, what were they doing? Down there playing. They said, this fellow Moses, we don't know what it, you know, to make of it. He's been gone for 40 days. Aaron, the high priest, who should have, of all people, known better, they said, make us a golden calf to lead us on into the promised land. We don't know if Moses is going to be back or not. Verse 8, neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and 20,000. Numbers chapter 25, verses 1 through 9. They joined themselves to Baal Peor. God wasn't happy. Verse 9, neither let us tempt Christ. That's to test him. As some of them also tempted. Who did they tempt? They tempted God. Numbers chapter 14, 10 times they tempted God over the golden calf, over the manna, uh, over the water. And finally, what? They were going to appoint a captain to lead them back into Egypt, the, the utmost rebellion against God's plan. Neither let us tempt Christ as some also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. As the children of Israel were working their way at the, as they left Hormah, and they were going around Edom because the Edomites wouldn't let them cross their land. But the going got pretty rough and the people were complaining again. Moses, why did you bring us out here in this desert to die? And God was getting so tired of it, he sent fiery serpents among them and those that were bitten by the fiery serpents died. And as usual, Moses interceded on their behalf and was instructed by God to make a brazen serpent that he lifted up and those who would look upon the brazen serpent, even though they were bitten by the serp, that the snakes would, would not die. That's why Christ would say in John chapter three, just as Moses raised the serpent, so must the son of man be raised on the cross. In other words, those that look upon him live as well. Verse 10, neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Those 10 spies that went into the promised land, God struck them dead with a special plague. He wasn't happy with them at all. And the reason we came here, verse 11, now all these things happened unto them for in samples. Again, that Greek word, tupos, a type. And they are written for our admonition, for our warning is what Paul is saying upon whom the ends of the world are come. And boy, have you ever talked, and I know none of you are this way because you're too studied in God's word, but have you ever been talking to a young Christian and you say, the end of the world? And I mean, the knees start shaking. The end of the world? Of course, you know we're talking about aeon in the Greek language, the age. That's all we're talking about when this world age ends, a new one begins. We're talking about this generation, the generation of the fig tree. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. Now this is from Paul, and Paul, listen to this. Take heed that 
that you think you stand, lest you fall. And that's the, 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 what I want you to get out of this message today. Do you think you're going to stand against the Antichrist? And Paul said, and I know you are, but what I'm encouraging you to do is, have I done everything I can do to prepare for that? Do I know, know everything I can possibly know about that enemy that will help me? And that's what we're going to do today. Verse 13. This is the promise from God. Don't ever forget this verse. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. There's nothing that's going to happen to you that hasn't happened to man before. Well, you don't understand, Pastor Murray. We live in that generation that we're going to face the Antichrist. So what? The people in the wilderness were tempted, were they not? This is nothing new. Man has been tempted from the get-go here on earth. In the flesh, in itself, is a temptation. But God is faithful. You can count on him. Who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with that temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Man, as you're delivered up before that Antichrist, don't forget this verse, beloved. I mean, think of that promise from God. Do you believe his word? Th then what do we have to worry about? He's not going to allow anything to happen to us. Verse 14. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to wise men, judge ye what I say. Do you consider yourself a wise person? Then listen to what Paul says. As I said earlier, the Assyrian over and over and over laid siege on Jerusalem. Let's go to the first time the Assyrian laid siege on Israel. We're going to 2 Kings chapter 15. Things aren't going well in Israel at all. As we pick this up, we're down to the last, I think, five kings of Israel. And as we're going to pick it up in 2 Kings 15, 16 with Menahem. Menahem, how did he come to the throne? Well, you can read it in verse 14. He smote Shalem. He murdered Shalem. Israel, the ten tribes, are on a collision course with the Assyrian, the captivity. Verse 16, then Menahem smote Tipsah. Tipsah is not a person, but a location, a city. The Greeks and Romans called it Thapsacus, and it lies on the Euphrates. It's referred to in 1 Kings 4.24 as the limit of Solomon's empire to, towards the Euphrates, in other words, to the north. And all that were therein, and the coast thereof from Terza, because they opened not to him, therefore he smote it, and all the women therein that were with child he ripped up. Tipsa revolted from Israel at the time that Zechariah was murdered. And here they're paying a very cruel uh, punishment for that revolt. In the nine and thirtieth year of Azariah, king of Judah, began Menahem, the son of Gadi, to reign over Israel and reigned ten years in Samaria. And you know, God wanted to be the king of Israel. What did the people of Israel say to Samuel? No, we want a man king like the heathen have, someone who will go and fight our battles for us. I think man is becoming somewhat disappointed and the kings of Israel a little bit less than they expected, but the man kings of Israel are exactly what our father expected. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. He departed not all his days from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. And you know, when Israel was asking for a man king, God told them through Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 8, verses 10 and the following verses, what men king of Israel would do. They'll take your sons and daughters. They'll make them work for you. Everything that you do to, to produce your vineyards, your olive yards, They'll take 10% of that and give it to their servants. And then they'll take your sons and send them to do the fighting for you. For the king, in other words. Verse 19. 
and Pool, the king of Assyria. Here we go, our type for the Antichrist. This is the first invasion on Israel by the Assyrian. It won't be the last, and there is still one to come in the future. Came against the land, and Menahem gave Pool a thousand talents of silver that his hand might be with him to confirm the kingdom in his hand. He's trusting in the king of Assyria to keep him as king of Israel rather than trusting in our heavenly father and paying him off to do so. And Menahem exacted the money of Israel. And, and Judah was usually the one that was uh, the one trying to bribe the enemy, not Israel. But in this case, they are. Even of all the mighty men of wealth, property owners in other words, of each man 50 shekels of silver to give to the king of Assyria. So the king of Assyria turned back and stayed not there in the land. And the, the Assyrians will be back. You know, you can't buy a bully off. Never try and buy a bully off because what you give him, he'll always be back for more. And the rest of the acts of Menahem and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Israel? And I'm certain God must have been quite frustrated with the kings of Israel, the, the men who served in that role. And Menahem slept with his fathers, and Pekahiah, his son, reigned in his stead. Pekahiah means Yah has observed. And you can be assured Yah is, was observing this Pekahiah in Israel at the time. You can be assured he's observing you and I today. I hope he's pleased. Verse 23. In the 50th year of Azariah, also known as Uzziah, and by the way, he reigned 52 years, the longest king of Israel or Judah, the king of Judah, Pekahiah, the son of Menahem, began to reign over Israel in Samaria and reigned two years. And becoming a king of Israel at this time was like an early death wish. Uh, Menahem was the last king of Israel to die of natural death and his son assumed the throne. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. He departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. You know, Jeroboam, got, uh, he was the first king of the ten tribes over the north after the, the kingdom was taken away from Solomon's son, Rehoboam. But you know, God made Jeroboam the same promise that he made to Solomon. And that is, if you will follow my commandments, if you will do things my way, I'll be with you. I'll bless you. What did Jeroboam do? Oh, he decides, uh, let's see. There's seven feasts of the Lord. Let's have an eighth one in the eighth month. Wasn't appointed by God. Jeroboam also said, well, these Le Levitical priests, they won't do what I want them to. To heck with them. They're out of office. I'm going to appoint my own priests. And that's what he did. And then to top it all off, he makes the two golden calves, just like Aaron did when, when Moses was receiving the law, put one in Bethel and one in Dan, and he said, Behold thy God that brought you out of Egypt and to the people of Israel. You don't need to go down to Jerusalem and worship at the temple of God. These are your gods. Stay here in Samaria and worship. 25, but Pika, Pika is kind of a version of Pekahiah, obviously. It means to watch, and this Pika needed to be watched. The son of Remaliah, a captain of his, he's in the army of Pika, the king, conspired against him and smote him in Samaria in the palace of the king's house with Argob and Ariae, and these two obviously trying to defend Pekahiah. And with him, this is Pekah, 50 men of the Gileadites, and he killed him and reigned in his room, murderers serving as the king of Israel. Total chaos, total corruption in Israel at this time. And the rest of the acts of Pekahiah and all that he did, behold, they are written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Israel. Israel at this point is on a collision course with the captivity to the Assyrian. And you know what? We're on a collision course to the captivity to the king of Assyria as well. 
Isaiah was prophesying this same thing at this time. Uh, and and I, uh, Isaiah, by the way, uh, prophesied during the reign of four different kings of Judah. I mean, Isaiah was around a long time. And he was telling them, this is what's coming. 27, in the two and 50th year of Azariah, this would be his last year, king of Judah, Pekah, the son of Remaliah, began to reign over Israel and Samaria and reigned 20 years. A very long reign for one of these final kings of Israel. Second Kings 18 verse 11. And the king of Assyria did carry away Israel into Assyria and put them in Hala and in Habor by the river Gosan and in the cities of the Medes. Why did the Lord let them go into captivity? Verse 12, because they obeyed not the voice of the Lord their God, but transgressed his covenant and all that Moses the servant of the Lord commanded and would not hear them nor do them. We see a lot of that today, do we not? Now in the 14th year of the king Hezekiah, this is the king of Judah, did Sennacherib, king of Assyria, come up against all the fenced cities of Judah and took them. In the appendix 67 of your companion Bible, uh, you have a, an, an appendix concerning Sennacherib cylinder. And he states that I took 46 fenced cities of Judah, and I have Hezekiah as a bird in a cage in Jerusalem, and I've taken 200,150 men, women, and children in captivity. And Hezekiah, king of Judah, sent to the king of Assyria to Lachish, this is a city south of Jerusalem, saying, I have offended, return from me, that which thou puttest on me will I bear. And the king of Assyria appointed unto Hezekiah, king of Judah, 300 talents of silver and 30 talents of gold. I've offended you, so please withdraw from Judah and I'll pay whatever tribute you say for me to pay. And you know, this is hard for me to understand about Hezekiah. Hezekiah was a righteous king. He, he was a good man. Boy, especially compared to his father Ahaz. He was an idolater if there ever was one. But, you know, this turned into a blessing for Judah because of Sennacherib's blasphemy and his pride. Let's see, blasphemy and pride. Who does that sound like? Maybe Antichrist a little bit? Blasphemy? He's going to be claiming to be God, standing in God's place, put his throne where God's throne is supposed to be. Pride? That was his downfall. Sound familiar? And Hezekiah gave him all the silver that was found in the house of the Lord and in the treasures of the king's house, buying peace. It won't be enough to satisfy Sennacherib for long. At that time did Hezekiah cut off the gold from the doors of the temple of the Lord and from the pillars which Hezekiah king of Judah had overlaid and gave it to the king of Assyria. Now, in chapter, chapter 18, verse 17, which we're about to get to through 1932nd, we have the second invasion of Judah by the king of Assyria. And the king of Assyria sent Tartan and Rabsaris and, and Rabshakeh from Lachish, about 10 miles southeast of Jerusalem, to King Hezekiah with a great host against Jerusalem. You know what a great host is? That's a big army. Does the thought of that frighten you? A big army? How about Revelation chapter 9, the locust army? You know what they've got? They've got tails that sting like a scorpion. You know what that means? It means that they melt the backbone of their victims using the victim's own body as their own stomach. Does that frighten you, this big army? It shouldn't. And they went up and came to Jerusalem. And when they were come up, they came and stood by the conduit of the upper pool, which is in the highway of the fuller's field. And, you know, you might say, well, now wait a minute. 
Israel was doing bad, and God sent the Assyrian, but Judah was doing good. Hezekiah was a pious king. Why, why would he send the Assyrian against Judah? Understand, God will test you from time to time. He does not want a bunch of hothouse lilies that are going to wilt at the first sign of trouble. You know, it's awfully hard to become an overcomer if you never have anything to overcome. And when they had called to the king, there came out to them Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, which was over the household, in other words, over the king's palace, and Shebna, the scribe, and Joah, the son of Asaph, the recorder. These pretty high-ranking officials. And Rabshakeh said unto them, Speak ye now to Hezekiah, thus saith the great king, the king of Assyria, what confidence is this wherein thou trustest? Well, he's pretty proud of his, his king, isn't he? The great king, the king of Assyria. Is that a type for us? Absolutely. Satan's going to think he's pretty great in his role. Verse 20, thou, this address to Hezekiah, sayest, but they are but vain words. You, you say this, this, this in the Hebrew is lip words. In other words, you say this but with your lips, but you really don't believe it with your heart. I have counsel and strength for the war. Now on whom dost thou trust that thou rebellest against me? Now behold, thou trustest upon the staff of this bruised reed, even upon Egypt, on which if a man lean, it will go into his hand and pierce it. So is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, unto all that trust on him. God wanted his people to trust and lean on him, not the king of Egypt, not, not some other man or some other god. Verse 22, Rabshakeh continues speaking for Sennacherib the Assyrian. But, or, or on the other hand, if you say unto me, we trust in the Lord our God, is not that he whose high places and whose altars Hezekiah hath taken away and hath said to Judah and Jerusalem, you shall worship before this altar in Jerusalem. Why, why should Yahweh help you when your king tore down all the illegal places of worship that the previous kings of Judah had set up. 23, now therefore I pray thee, give pledges to my Lord, give them to Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, and I will deliver thee 2,000 horses if thou be able on thy part to set riders upon them. Still even less than depending on the bruised reed of Egypt can you depend on your own army? If I gave you 2,000 horses, you don't even have enough men capable of putting on there that could fight from horseback. How then wilt thou turn away the face of one captain of the least of my master's servants and put thy trust on Egypt for chariots and for horse horsemen? Your military is so weak, you have no choice but to depend on Egypt. Am I now come up without the Lord against this place to destroy it? Your God, Hezekiah, is now with me. That Lord there is Yahweh. The Lord said to me, go up against this land and destroy it. Now we got some problems for the Assyrian. God had not commanded him to go up and destroy Judah. This is out and out blasphemy. Then said Eliakim the son of Hilkiah, and Shebna, and Joah, unto Rabshakeh, Speak, I pray thee, to thy, thy servants, in other words, to us, in the Syrian language, in, in Aramaic, for we understand it, and talk not with us in the Jews' language, or Hebrew, in the ears of the people that are on the wall. We, we understand your, your language, so please, you know, you're scaring our troops over here on the wall. Don't, don't, don't talk in Hebrew. You're, you're scaring our people. But Rabshakeh said unto them, Hath my master, that's Sennacherib, sent me to thy master and to thee to speak these words? Hath he not sent me to the men which sit on the wall, the soldiers, that they may eat their own dung and drink their own piss with you? In other words, that's how bad it's going to get if the Assyrian lays siege on Jerusalem. Three years is a long time to lay siege. What do they do basically? 
They starve them out. If, if, you, get, if you can't get food into the city and you've got uh, probably tens of thousands of people there at the time, if not over 100,000 people there, they're going to starve to death eventually. And of course, they had routed water on their secret, secret passageways into Jerusalem and taken it away. But I also ask you to look at that maybe as a little bit of a type. If you don't participate in the Assyrians and, and Antichrist one world system, you're on your own when it comes to food and water. Let me ask you this. Has anyone ever warned you that we should have a little bit of food set aside for when the Antichrist comes? Has, has anyone ever warned you that you should have some water set aside for your family? Because you're on your own, folks. You're not going to be able to buy and sell. Has anyone ever warned you to have a little bit of precious metal available to where you can barter and trade? Have you done that? Have you done it to the extent that and people might say, well, you don't understand. You know, I'm living check to check right now. It's just hard for me to do that. And I understand, boy, with gasoline prices, I filled up on the way up here. And you talk about making your knees shake. That made my knees shake, filling up that SUV. Woo! But my point is this. It's a lot easier right now for you to do what you need to do and get some things set aside than it's going to be when he actually arrives because I mean everything in your, your checking account. You think you're going to be able to use that? No, not without taking the mark of the beast and worshiping him. So a little bit of a type there. A little graphic maybe. I apologize if too. Verse 28. Then Rabshake stood and cried with a loud voice in the Jews' language, Hebrew, and spake, saying, Hear the word of the great king, the king of Assyria. We're about to see some real psychological warfare here, propaganda. Thus saith the king, let not Hezekiah deceive you, for he shall not be able to deliver you out of his hand, out of the king of Assyria's hand. In other words, don't let Hezekiah give you false hope. Neither let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, the Lord will surely deliver us and this city shall not be delivered into the hand of the king of Assyria. Hezekiah can't save you. The Lord can't save you. Now, wait a minute. I know the Lord is my deliverer. And here we've got the king of Assyria saying, the Lord can't deliver you. That's blasphemy. Hearken not to Hezekiah, for thus saith the king of Assyria, Make an agreement with me by a present and come out to me. And then eat ye every man of his own vine and every one of his fig tree. And drink ye every one the waters of his cistern. Boy, does that sound like somebody? How about Dan chapter 11 verse 24? When the Antichrist comes in peacefully and prosperously. You see, he's promising <clears throat> these people on the wall around Jerusalem, just surrender, just worship me, and it's going to be good for you. I'll pay off all your bills. Remember where we started with Paul giving you a warning? These things happened as examples for you, types for you. Don't be taken with his deceit. Verse 32 until I come and take you away to a land like your own land. I'll deliver you. Hezekiah can't deliver you. The Lord can't deliver you. I'll rapture you out of here. A land of corn and wine, a land of bread and vineyards, a land of oil, olive, and of honey, that ye may live and not die. And we're talking about a death of the flesh here that they're concerned about. And hearken not unto Hezekiah when he persuadeth or deceives, that could be translated, you saying, the Lord will deliver us. You can't trust Hezekiah, you can't trust the Lord. Wrong. Hath any of the gods of the nations delivered at all his land out of the hand of the king of Assyria? None of the gods of the nations that the Assyrians have already conquered could save them. 
Where are the gods of Hamath and Arpad that's in Syria? Where are the gods of Sepharvaim, Hena, and Iva? Have they delivered Samaria, the ten tribes of Israel, out of mine hand? Let me ask you this. When the Antichrist returns, who are, is everyone in the world going to think their God is? You know, and think what I'm saying here. Where are their gods? Everyone in the world. I don't care if they're Islamic. I don't care if they're Buddhist. I don't care what their faith is. They're going to think Antichrist is God. Are you prepared for that in your mind? And you know what they're going to be asking you because you're not worshiping him? <coughs> Excuse me. Where is your God is what they're going to be asking you. 35. Who are they among all the gods of the countries that have delivered their country out of mine hand that the Lord should deliver Jerusalem out of mine hands? Their gods couldn't save them. Your God can't save you. But the people held their peace and answered him not a word, for the king's commandment was saying, answer him not. Probably smart not to let the enemy know what the effect of his speech was. It was very effective. Then came Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah, which was over the household, and Shebna, the scribe, and Joah, the son of Asaph, the recorder, to Hezekiah with their clothes rent, sign of mourning or grief, and told him the words of Rob Shekah. Pretty good speech, but the problem is Rob Shekah has not only blasphemed Hezekiah, he's also blasphemed our Heavenly Father. Chapter 19, verse 1. And it came to pass when King Hezekiah heard it that he rent his clothes and covered himself with sackcloth and went into the house of the Lord. You know, when things get rough, it doesn't matter where you are. The, books of Psalm, the book of Psalms tells us that wherever you are at any time, you can take refuge in the house of the Lord. That's the sanctuary. In other words, you, you can seek protection and aid in, in, in that high tower, if you will. He will deliver you as we were promised and where we started today, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. And he said, and he sent, I should say, Eliakim, which was over the household, and Shebna the scribe, and the elders of the priests, covered with sackcloth, to Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos. Now, this is the first occurrence of Isaiah in the historical books. And they said unto him, Thus saith Hezekiah, This day is a day of trouble. The day of Jacob's trouble might come to mind, and of rebuke and blasphemy. For the children are come to the birth, and there is not strength to bring forth. This is a life-threatening situation. When, when a mother is with child and it's time to deliver that child, if she doesn't have the strength to deliver that child, both will die. Both will perish. What's that got to do with what we've been talking about? Let me tell you, there's a birth that all of you are involved in, and I don't care if you're a man or a woman. I'm talking about the birth of a new age. And we're going to see as we close here in a moment in the book of Micah, not history, prophecy, we're going to see that we have a part to play in bringing out the, the, about the birth of this new age. And I ask you, do you think we'll have the strength to do our part to accomplish the birth of a new age? We're going to have a lot of help. Let's see. Brings verse 4. It may be the Lord thy God will hear all the words of Rabshakeh, whom the king of Assyria, his master, hath sent to reproach the living God, and will reprove the words which the Lord thy God hath heard. Wherefore, lift, lift up thy prayer for the remnant that are left, most of Judah, 46 fenced cities. I'm talking walled cities. Over 200,000 people taken captive. Most of Judah is already gone captive to the Assyrian, in our day and age, the elect are the remnant that are left that have not gone into captivity to the Assyrian. So the servants of, the king, of king Hezekiah came to Isaiah, 
And Isaiah said unto them, Thus shall you say to your master, Hezekiah in other words, Thus saith the Lord, Be not afraid of the words which thou hast heard, with which the servants of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. And there's no reason for you to fear either. Verse 7, Behold, I will send a blast upon him, and he shall hear a rumor, and shall return to his own land, and I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. Historically, this would come to pass. If we continued on in the same chapter, we'd learn in verse 28, God told the Assyrian, I will put my hook in your nose and my bridle in thy lips and lead thee back by the way you came. In verse 35, the angel of the Lord slew 185,000 of the Assyrians. Verse 32, Sennacherib, back in his home city, went into the house of his God and was murdered by his own two sons. This particular siege of the Assyrian was not successful. You know, we've been talking about the future siege of the Assyrian. Do you think the Assyrian is going to be successful during that siege? Or do you think God will once again send a blast? Oh, maybe, maybe you could be part of that blast. Turn with me to Micah as we conclude. Again, not history, but prophecy in the Minor Prophets. Micah chapter 4, and we're going to pick it up with verse 8. When I was talking a minute ago about that birth that was going to be coming about and that the men and the women were going to have part of it, my humor just went crazy with me. Have you all ever seen that commercial where the, this old little old man and little old lady are sitting in the doctor's office and, I mean, she's like 80 and he's like 85 and the doctor tells her, your blood work shows that you're pregnant. And then he looks at the old man and he says, and guess what, you are too. And the little man just giggles and starts laughing. Have you seen that? I think that's one of the greatest commercials. But man or woman, you got a role to play in the birth that's coming up. And I'm talking about the birth of this new age. Micah 4, 8. Sharpen up for me now. This gets a little deep. And thou, O tower of the flock. You know what this word flock in the Hebrew? Check it out. Eater. In Genesis chapter 35, verse 21, eater is used for Bethlehem. Check it out the stronghold of the daughter of Zion. You're the daughter of Zion. Bethlehem, how come that's the stronghold for you? Unto thee shall it come, even the first dominion, or former dominion, first earth age. The kingdom shall come to the daughter of Jerusalem. What happened in Bethlehem? Eder, the flock, as it's called there. Well, let's see. Rachel, she didn't have the strength to bring forth, did she? She died in childbirth to the last patriarch of the 12 tribes of Israel. Named him ben son of my sorrow. His father renamed him Benjamin, son of my right hand. Let's see. Who else was born in Jerusalem? David was born in, Jer- in Bethlehem, was he not? Bethlehem, not Jerusalem. Oh, and a thousand yards within the place that Rachel gave birth to Benjamin and David was born, Messiah would be born. He is the chief shepherd. Verse 9, Now why dost thou cry out aloud? This is to the daughter of Zion, that's you. Is there no king in thee? Is thy counselor perished? For pangs have taken thee as a woman in travail. Here we have that birth of a new age. Have you got a part in it? 
Be in pain and labor to bring forth, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in travail. For now shalt thou go forth out of the city, and thou shalt dwell in the field, and thou shalt go even to Babylon. There shalt thou be delivered. There the Lord shall redeem thee from the hand of thine enemies. Many of our brothers and sisters are already there in Babylon. Babylon meaning confusion. They're lost. They haven't a clue as to what's going to happen in these end days. Have you got a role in doing something about that? Now also many nations are gathered against thee that say, let her be defiled and let her eye look upon Zion. And boy, will Jerusalem be defiled when that Assyrian sets up shop. But they know not the thoughts of the Lord. They haven't read the thoughts of the Lord like we're studying his thoughts now. Neither understand they his counsel or his plan. For he shall gather them as the sheaves into the floor. Oh, let's see. Isn't there a wonderful gospel song about bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves? This, doesn't this sound wonderful? They're bringing in the sheaves onto the floor. You know what floor we're talking about here, beloved? The threshing floor. Do you know what happens to the sheaves on the threshing floor? They get the way knocked out of them. Some of the sheaves need the way knocked out of them to bring about some sense into their heads. Do you have something to do with that? Arise and thresh. This is instructions to the daughter of Zion. I'm talking to you. Arise and thresh. And what does threshing do? It separates the wheat from the chaff. It separates those who can amount to something, something that is worth something, from wicked and evil that's worth nothing but to go into the fire. O daughter of Zion, for I will make thine horn iron. You know what your horn is symbolically? It's your power. And I will make thy hooves brass, and thou shalt beat in pieces many people. And I will consecrate their gain unto the Lord and their substance unto the Lord of the whole earth. Well, that sounds awful rough. I will beat those people. What do we beat them with, beloved? Truth. That's what we beat them with. How do we thresh today? What is this talking about? You thresh by planting seeds. Every time you have an opportunity to plant a seed, you're threshing, you're sharing God's truth. That's what knocks the way out of those sheaves and separates the wheat from the chaff. You can thresh by being an example to people. You can, you can, be, uh, you can thresh by standing for something. And by that I mean be willing to stand against the Antichrist. Oh, there's a blast going to be sent against this last Assyrian siege. Assyrian siege, chapter 5, verse 1. Now gather thyself in troops, O daughter of troops. He, this is the Assyrian we're talking about here, Antichrist, hath laid siege against us. They shall smite the judge of Israel with a rod upon the cheek. And historically, they certainly accomplished this, the ten tribes of Israel into captivity. And there's going to be a little different smiting going on this next siege. Sharpen up for me. But thou, Bethlehem, here we go again. Where are we pointing back to now? Jesus Christ's birthplace. Bethlehem, the house of bread. Ephratah, meaning fruitful. Though thou be little among the thousands of Judah. Though you're just a little village, Bethlehem, compared to the larger cities of, of Judah. Yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel. You remember back in verse 9 where it said, Is there no king in thee? God's chosen a king. Whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Oh, that sounds like somebody I know. John chapter 1 verse 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. From old, the first earth age. 
here in the second earth age, and yes, beloved, in the third earth age, the eternity, Jesus Christ will be present. Therefore will he give them up until the time that she which travaileth hath brought forth. Then the remnant of his brethren shall return unto the children of Israel, out of Babylon, out of the captivity, and you've got a part to play in it. And you know, some say, well, isn't this nice? God's going to find the people that he lost. God hasn't lost anyone. They've lost themselves. And he, this is Jesus Christ, shall stand and feed in the strength of the Lord. He is the great shepherd. In the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they, his flock, shall abide. For now shall he be great unto the ends of the earth. King of kings and Lord of lords. And this man shall be the peace. Hebrews chapter 7 where he's also called Melchizedek. What's another name? You know what the king of Salem is? King of peace. There will be no peace until he returns. Listen up for me. When the Assyrian, this is Antichrist, shall come into our land and when he shall tread in our palaces. He wants to be the king. He'll be in the palace, believe me. Then shall we raise against him seven shepherds and eight principal men. Ooh, I wonder what, you know, Bullinger, you know. How many of you think a lot of E.W. Bullinger? Do you know what his comment concerning this verse is? When it comes time for us to know what this means, we'll know. I think the time has come for us to know what this verse means. How many elect are there? 7,000? No, that can be any number, don't get me wrong. Boy, I mean, if there's just 7,000, wow. There's a lot of them in this same room. 7,000, that's just a number. But seven, the, the 7,000 elect, and we add one, Melchizedek, the king of the Zedek, to that. How many is that? That's eight, is it not? I think you've got a part in this. And they shall waste the land of Assyria with the sword. What sword are we talking about? Revelation chapter 1, verse 16, that two-edged sword, the tongue of Christ that cuts both ways. When your tongue holds that same truth, it's the same sword, beloved. He's got a role for you in this. And the land of Nimrod, that's Assyria and Babylon, in the entrances thereof, thus shall he, Christ, deliver us from the Assyrian when he cometh into our land and when he treadeth within our borders, claiming to be Jesus, claiming to be our king, deceiving the world. And the remnant of Jacob, that's you, the elect, shall be in the midst of many people. Whoa, what are all these many people? We're talking about the kings and queens of the ethnos, beloved. As a dew, you know what dew is? That's a real pure form of water, unless we pollute it. From the Lord as the showers, oh, wait a minute, latter day rain maybe, upon the grass that tarrieth not for man, nor waiteth for the sons of men. It's not dependent on men, in other words. And the remnant of Jacob, that's you, shall be among the Gentiles in the midst of many people as a lion among the beasts of the forest, as a young lion among the flocks of sheep, who if he go through, both treadeth down and teareth in pieces, and none can deliver. Oh, that doesn't sound very Christian at all, does it? The weapon, beloved, is the truth. It's what we were talking about on that threshing floor. It, it's the truth that separates the good from the evil. There's a separation coming, beloved. And thank God, we don't want the wicked and the evil in the eternity. So take part in that. And, and, and you know, if someone hears the truth, the truth often offends people. God's word often offends people. My thoughts to that are, so what? 
it's always good for them. And hopefully they'll see the error of their way and turn it around. Here's a promise. Verse 9, thine hand, and this is still referring to the remnant, the elect, shall be lifted up upon thine adversaries and all thine enemies shall be cut off. And I do mean all of your enemies. And note, cut off is used five times over the next verses as we close. Five in the biblical numerics is grace. And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord, that I will cut off thy horses out of the midst of thee, and I will destroy thy chariots. Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39, the battle of Armageddon. Excuse me, that's Haman Gog and Ezekiel. Armageddon in Revelation. Whose battle is it at that point? It's not yours and mine. It's, it's time to stand back and say, go get them, Lord, because he's going to do it. Why is he going to do it? Because he wants everyone to know that he is real. As we go into the eternity, he wants to, people to know he is God and stop this nonsense of all the idolatry that's going around in the world. I think he's going to make believers out of them. I will cut off the cities of thy land and throw down all thy strongholds. No more wicked, no more evil. And I will cut off witchcrafts out of thine hand, out of thine hand, and thou shalt have no more soothsayers. Thy graven images also will I cut off, and thy standing images out of the midst of thee, and thou shalt no more worship the work of thine hands. And I'll include the image of the beast in Revelation chapter 13. And I will pluck up thy groves, the, the places where they practice pagan spiritual spring festivals, rolling Easter eggs on Easter instead of celebrating the Passover as we are doing here. Out of the midst of thee, so will I destroy thy cities. Ginsburg says the cities here should be translated uh, thine idols. 15 to conclude, and I will execute vengeance and anger and fury upon the heathen such as they have not heard. In Luke chapter 12, verse 49, Jesus said, I am sent as a fire. And what if when I return, I'm talking about the second advent, the flame is already kindled. And I hope that you got out of this today that you have a large part to do with that flame being kindled. You have a large part to do with bringing forth the birth of a new age. You have a large part to do with knocking the way out of the sheaves in hopes that we can pull one or two of them out of the fire. And the Assyrian, definitely a type for Antichrist. Can we learn from his types? I hope we can. We need to. We need to be prepared. I'll tell you, he's sharp. He's going to be good. Christ himself said, man, if this went on for three and a half years or seven years, I forget which it was when he said it, I fear there would be no flesh left. For the elect's sake, I'm going to shorten the period of time. So, I mean, if Christ was concerned enough that he thinks, well, I better shorten the time, we better be concerned as well. So with that, the Assyrian, I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did preparing it for you.